Yes, it's John G. Sutton. Tales from the Jails. Today I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, self-mutilation and self-injury in the prisons. You get quite a lot of it. People who just can't handle the time can't do it. They cut themselves very frequently. This is most frequent in female prisons, by the way. I was working at Style uh, 40 odd years ago, and uh, whilst I was there, there were a number of inmates on the hospital unit that uh, had uh, got their arms all bandaged. Uh, staff was telling me, you know, this is just uh, cutting themselves, and you know, they can't handle I don't know, this certain thing that uh, some people have for injuring themselves, but that was was quite prevalent in the male prisons as well. Another way of uh, damaging yourself as an inmate was to tattoo. What they did was they got ordinary ink, yeah, ordinary ink, and they got a needle or a, a pin, yeah, and they dipped the needle in the ink and that's how they did the tattoos. There was one guy, strange ways, believe this or not, he had got his cellmate to tattoo a word across his forehead, right across his forehead. It was Elvis. Seriously. I mean, everywhere he went, people go, Elvis. <laughs> and, and I don't know if you know, I mean, people who've been around the system for long enough, was uh, that the, the Borstal boys always had... Uh, on the wrists, yeah, usually about here on the wrist, a, a, a little tattoo of a stick man and like the saint, yeah, that was a sign that you'd been in in Borstal. Imagine that you're going for a job interview in your late thirties, and you want to be a manager of a bank, and uh, as you reach out to shake their hand, you say, ah. Oh, which postal were you in? <laughs> yeah, you ruin you for life. Mm -hmm. Of course, lots of uh, tattoos. They have them uh, tears tattooed on the side of your, of your face here, down like that, like a tear there. Every tear is somebody that you've murdered. Imagine advertising that. Yeah. When I was at Strangeways, there was a, a guy there who had a unique, well, I think it's pretty unique anyway, a unique way of uh, damaging himself. He used to eat, he was a swallower. I don't know if you've come across the, the swallowers. Well, they, they swallow anything, you know, like razor blades, razors. This guy used to swallow bed springs. You know, the, be the bed springs are about that long. They've kind of, you know, got a hook at each end. They hang on underneath the bed. So, yeah, they form like uh, a support for the mattress. This guy had swallowed about half a dozen bed springs when we got him to, to the hospital, you know, because obviously he couldn't eat after that. Got him to the hospital and x-rayed him. And there were all these bed springs inside him. I believe they had to operate to get them out. I mean, imagine that. Another thing that people would do is wrist slashing. I had a, I was on the hospital officer in charge of the psychiatric unit at Strange Ways for a while, and one inmate came to me one day and said, it's the voices, the voices, they're telling me I have to do it. I said, all right, just sit down here and tell me about them. I can't, I can't. Then he jumped up and ran at this window, <coughs> a big glass window, smash hands through the window like, like Superman diving out, you know, except the glass just shattered and he, bloody blood splattering everywhere. It's a good job I'm not too squeamish, yeah? You were squeamish in that job. You won't you last two minutes, yeah? I've told you, of course, about the guy who was uh, comatose, yeah, in a catatonic stupor, yeah? He was a former senior civil servant who'd murdered his wife. And he, the shock of what he'd done had put him into a catatonic stupor. Now, if you've never seen anybody in a catatonic stupor, they're like, you could get their arm, lift their arm up. That's where it'll stay. Move their arm. 
or it stay. They can't drink, they can't eat, they can't, they're just comatose. They're in, it's like that, everything's shut down, you know. They're just about breathing, you know. They brought him into the hospital ward, sat him on his bed, and that's where he stayed, sat on his bed. Came at night, we put him into his bed, laid him flat, you know. I was giving him water as best I could because he didn't responding. And the doctor said, if he keeps this up, he'll be dead within three or four days. You know, he was, there was nothing, he wouldn't take water or anything. So I'd read his file, you know, because I was the officer in charge of the other unit. So I read his, his, his file and it said he'd been, a, I think he was a principal officer in the civil service and a relatively senior uh, civil servant. I reasoned that he would like classical music, very likely, you know, because he looked an intelligent guy, but he was comatose, you know, com completely out of it. So I brought in some tapes and a little tape recorder, a uh, tape player, you know, and I put the tapes, I had loads of cassettes of classical music, I like classical music. Beethoven's Fifth, yeah, Vaughan Williams, The Lark Ascending. I love that. Puccini is my favourite opera, you know, La Boheme. And anyway, I brought a collection of this stuff in and I started to play it for him, put it in the cassette player, put him headphones on. He still sat on the side of his bed like that, yeah? Put the headphones on and uh, he, he listened to this classical music. We went through the lot, Mozart, Beethoven, you you name it, we, we did it. And then it came to one, I had a tape, it was Bluebeard's Castle by Bella Bartok. I put that in, switched it on, and this guy had been listening to all this music, not moving an inch, still catatonic stupor, yeah? We got into about ten minutes of Bella Bartok, and he took the headphones off, and he says to me, I can't stand Bella Bartok. I said, really? Don't you like? No, I said, never have. It was as if he'd, he'd just snapped out of it, and it was as if he'd never been in it. And he had a drink of water and he started tidying his bed up a little bit, you know, and he was all right after that. I made notes of all this. Anyway, the psychiatrist came round because he was seeing him on a daily basis. You know, the psychiatrist came round and said, oh, he's out of it now. He said, out of it? He said, how, do you, how has this happened? I said, well, I reasoned that being a senior civil servant, he may be an educated man and enjoy classical music. So I brought some classical music in on a cassette player and I've been playing him classical music all morning. Uh, we went through all the, all the usual Mozart, you know, Beethoven, you name it, we did it. Uh, I said, and when we got to Bella Bartok, he took the headphones off, he says, I can't stand Bella Bartok. Uh, he said, that's remarkable. He said, absolutely brilliant. He said, I'm gonna make a note of that, wonderful. Anyway, you'd have thought, you know, I'd done the job, I'd saved this man's life. The next morning, I got a call, it would be about 10 o'clock in the morning. I was still in, in charge of the ward, the telephone rang. Mr Sutton, get down to the chief's office. So they sent somebody up to uh, watch over the ward while I went down to see the chief officer. And uh, I went to see the chief. I said, yeah, what's the problem? He said, I've just been reading your notes here. He says that this, this inmate uh, has, has stated that he can't stand Bella Bartok. Who is this woman? I said, who is her? Uh, what woman? He said, Bella Bartok, who is she? He said, he can't stand her. He said, Bella Bartok is a Hungarian composer of classical music. He wrote the opera Bluebeard's Castle and I was playing him classical music to try and snap him out of his catatonic stupor. But he doesn't like Bella, but I said, it's not a woman, it's a classical composer from Hungary. What are you doing, playing classical music? And You've got no business doing this. I thought, you ignorant pig. You know, I've just saved this man's life. Seriously. Anyway. That's the, that, that, that's that's what you had to deal with there. They weren't interested in, in the inmates, in the patients. They were interested in their self-importance. But he couldn't have been that self-important if he didn't know who Bella Bartok was, could he? Anyway, life goes on. Self-injuries in prison, very prevalent. People try and hang themselves. 
you know, they, they actually do that, you know, hang them. So I've seen that. I've been to one or two of that. Quite often they get to a certain, you see, you don't snap your neck when you hang yourself from the, usually from the bars on the landing, you know, on, on the windows, you know, tie the throat around your neck. You don't, you don't snap your neck, you choke to death. And after about a minute or so of that, you start to... So I've seen been into one or two where it's quite obvious they've got so far and I want to take it off, but it's just a little bit too late by then. They've passed the point of no return. Yeah, mutilations, cutting the wrists, that's common, but it doesn't work. Now what happens is you bleed out probably three pints, yeah, but then your, your veins collapse because the blood pressure drops. And you collapse as well, but you don't die. I've been to one or two that's been cut, cut themselves quite deeply too, but it doesn't work. The let the veins collapse, you know, and the blood flow stops and the blood pressure drops and they collapse. Then the, the hospital staff come in, tidy them up, bandage them up, and get them off to uh, outside hospital where they give them blood transfusions and. It's a sad thing. It's a sad state of affairs. I mean, people should be watched better than that. But when you when you've got two thousand people in a prison built for nine hundred, you know, and that's what it was. Yeah, that's what it was at Strange Ways. At one time, we had over two thousand inmates in there. Right. Anyway, I think it's uh, time now. Yes, folks. It's the Songdinger. Yeah. What you've got to do now is make a decision. Do you want to risk it for a biscuit? Are you going to... Milk, by the way. Almond milk. It's not cow's milk. Anyway, I'm going to sing a song to you now. Well, I'm not going to really sing it, am I? I'm going to interpret it. This is a song written by a man called Chris Christopherson and it was recorded, made famous by Janis Joplin. It's me and Bobby McGee. Busted flat in Baton Rouge Heading for the trains Feeling nearly faded as my jeans Bobby thumbed a diesel down just before it rained, took us all the way to New Orleans. I took my harpoon out of my dirty red bandana, was blowing sad while Bobby sang the blues. With them windshield wipers slapping time and Bobby clapping hands, we finally sang up. Every song that driver knew. Uh, freedom is just another word for nothing left to lose. Nothing. It ain't worth nothing, but it's free. Feeling good was easy, Lord, when Bobby sang the blues. And, buddy, that was good enough for me. Good enough for me and Bobby McGee. From the coal mines of Kentucky to the California sun, Bobby shared the secrets of my soul. Standing right beside me, Lord, through everything i done, every night she kept me from the cold. Then, somewhere near Salinas, Lord, I let her slip away, looking for the home I hope she'll find. And I'd trade all my tomorrows for a single yesterday, holding body, body next to mine. Oh, freedom is just another word for nothing left to lose. Nothing left. It's all she left for me. Feeling good was easy, Lord, when Bobby sang the blues. And, buddy, that 
was good enough for me. Good enough for me and Bobby McGee. There you go. I reckon they missed that train. Tales from the Jails with John G. Sutton. I hope you've subscribed, liked, all the rest of it. Seems to help. Thank you very much.